yes, yes. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Krishan Kumar, I, I really thank you very much for uh, you know accepting our invitation to deliver a talk and he is exceptionally busy man and is probably the best uh, pediatric cardiologist I know of uh, in India. And uh, he's from Amrita Institute and is uh, heading the department of uh, pediatric cardiology. He did DM cardiology in All India Institute. I still do not know where we have uh, met uh, before. I thought he was on PGI, but I don't think so. He did anything in PGI. Did you do your MD in PGI, or sir? Or no, 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 sir. I've been visiting PGI very frequently. I, I know. I I know somehow, MD. somehow, whenever I meet, I uh, you loud so sound familiar. I've been meeting. Uh, more than not. And he did his fellowship in Children's Hospital of Boston in the U.S. way back in 1996. And he's an excellent academic uh, uh, career. He is uh, established, he is the person who established pediatric cardiac uh, program in Amrita Institute and developed a teamwork. And uh, uh, he, in fact, uh, developed a lot of low cost techniques which are unique to India and requirement of India. And uh, he's established large, uh, you know, community-based uh, studies on rheumatic uh, fever and heart disease. So uh, I, I think uh, he is a past president of Pediatric Cardiac Society of India. And uh, I, I, I am so honored to have him here and deliver a talk. Uh, um, he has two talks to deliver. And first one is a common AV canal defect. Uh, Dr. Krishan, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. UP Singh for this wonderful opportunity and um, uh, I would uh, uh, very much uh, cherish this uh, chance to speak to such a large audience that has gathered here today. I will be talking about AV canal, AV septal defect and it's important that we, um, can you see my screen sir? Is my screen visible? Yes, yes, yes sir. All good. Um, so again, uh, I can see Dr. Para, Colonel Parashar is uh, logged in and my respects and pronounce to you, sir. You are and I am getting to see you. It's uh, such a privilege. And uh, I'll start by talking to you about AV septal defect. Um, yeah, terminology, this terminology of AV septal defect is something that is now used by Dr. Anderson. Um, and he encourages the use of this word rather than AV canal defect. So we will uh, essentially try and clarify a little bit about this classification. And I'll try to walk you through the echo with echo anatomy correlation so that you understand this defect from a, purely from an echo perspective. And why do we do echo? We do echo because we guide the surgeons. So I'll try to present a surgical checklist. So the classification, I'll try to make it as simple as possible, is partial intermediate and complete. So this is one classification that we, simple classification that we use. And it's important to understand that it is embryological. So the most primitive situation that you have where the common AV valve exists is what I've shown you here. Um, superior endocardial cushion, inferior endocardial cushion, lateral cushion, lateral cushion, and dextrodorsal cushion. Now, this is how the embryonal AV septal region is. And then it separates. It separates by the formation of a tongue-like tissue, after which gradually the two annuli come closer to each other and they separate into two valves. It's important to understand this to understand AV canal. So the most primitive forms would look like the embryonal form. And then depending on when the development has arrested, you get this uh, various defects. So the partial AV canal has two separate annuli, two full annuli that are formed, but the valve is not normal. There is a cleft in the mitral leaflet. The transitional AV canal also has nearly separate annuli, but there is usually an associated VST. In partial AV canal, there is no PST. So that's the difference between partial and transition. Okay. Uh, then we also have one separate category called the intermediate AV canal. So intermediate AV canal is when there is a bridge of tissue. So the arrest in development has occurred before the annuli separate, but the leaflets have separated. 
So there's a bridge of tissue between anterior and posterior bridging leaf. This is rare. Intermediate canal is rare and hard to diagnose on echo. You can suspect, but it's hard to diagnose. As far as you're concerned on echo, you should classify it as complete, partial, or transitional. So this is a complete defect, and that's the intermediate defect that I've showed you. So to summarize, in partial AV septal defect, you have two separate annuli, two separate orifices, and no VST. In transitional, you have two separate annuli, two separate orifices, and a small VST. In intermediate, you have one annulus, two orifices, and a VST. Almost always have a large VST. And a complete AV septal defect is when you have just one annulus, one orifice, and a large VST. So that is the simple classification of AV septal defect. Now, I'll just show you some common features of all AV septal defects. All of them have these common features. First, the AV, both the leaflets insert at the same level at the cardiac crux. Crux is where the atrial septum and the ventricular septum come together. Usually there is offsetting, mitral valve is higher, tricuspid valve is lower, but in AV septal defect, they are at the same level. So that kind of uh, classific the, uh, appearance is something which is very important. Second feature, that since you don't have a common orifice, the aorta has to move front. It becomes anteriorly displaced and unwedged. Normally, the aorta sits between the two AV valves on the anterior aspect. Now the aorta has to be pushed forward. So that's also very important. Second, of course, you have an elongated uh, LVOT, which is known as the gooseneck deformity. The gooseneck deformity is essentially a long LVOT that results from the fact that the aorta has been displaced anterior. Now, generally, the LVOT is not obstructed, but occasionally it can get obstructed. So, in this diagram, shows you the relationship between inlet and outlet. And the fact that the aorta is pushed anteriorly and superiorly makes the outlet longer than the inlet. Whereas in the normal situation, the outlet and inlet are almost the same size. And this is essentially the gooseneck deformity that we talk about. So this is the other uh, feature that you see is the orientation of the papillary muscle. So papillary muscles, normally, if you see the LV from the apical side, the papillary muscle is at 2 o'clock and at maybe six or seven o'clock, the lateral and medial papillary muscles, now they come close to each other and rotate clockwise. So that they become at around five o'clock and at around three o'clock. Now that's a very important feature again, because that dictate, dictates the size of the lateral um, leaflet, which is very important in surgical decision, okay? So this kind of clockwise rotation and coming closer to each other is another feature. Then there is a very important feature that people are not familiar with, and that is the cleft of the mitral leaflet. This is the cleft. You never see this in a normal leaflet. Normally, you see the anterior mitral leaflet like this. You don't see the cleft. The anterior mitral leaflet has been divided into the cleft, and cleft actually opens and closes. As you can see here, the cleft opens and closes out here, and it's moving towards the septum. And this recognition of the cleft is very, very important. And where it is coming is very important because that enables you to understand the basis of AV valve regurgitation in most patients. The size of this leaflet is very important because that dictates the feasibility of surgical repair. And I'll talk to you about the surgical repair subsequently. On a 3D echo, the cleft is beautifully seen. You can see the cleft going towards the septum very nicely. And you can see it's almost like an orifice. The difference between a cleft and a commissure is that at the commissure on the edges of the leaflet, you have the caudal attachments. Whereas in cleft, you don't have the caudal attachments. So that's a very fundamental difference. Because of the absence of caudal at attachments, the cleft is prone to get leaky and prone to become incompetent. So even if it is not incompetent at the time of surgery, the surgeons often close the cleft to prevent future leakage. Okay. 
So that's the cleft that you can see moves towards the septum. It's beautifully seen from a superior aspect, very nicely seen. So five features. The AV valve leaflets insert at the same level at the cardiac crux. There is an anterior displacement of the aortic valve. The LVOT is elongated. There is counterclockwise rotation of the papillary muscles, and there is a cleft in the mitral leaflet, anterior mitral leaf, anterior aspect of the mitral leaflet, which is basically uh, directed towards the septum. Now, how do you demonstrate it? Now, there was a lot of discussion earlier, and I've been through this. Dr. U.P. Singh also mentioned that we are showing things upside down in pediatric cardiology, but we have to show it this way because you have to get the anatomic orientation. So you have to cut the heart. You see that section that's being taken at the level of the AV valve. You have to take this section. Now you can take this section from parasternal short axis view. You can take this section from the sub xiphoid. Not exactly short axis, but in between view. In between coronal plane and sagittal plane, in between view, you will cut the septum, the heart, at the level of the AV uh, ring. Now that will give you the most beautiful appearances of the AV canal. Nothing can match what you can get from the sub xiphoid view. And you try and move your transducer slightly downwards and to the right, and you can use the liver as a solid interface of the ultrasound. So this is the view out here. You put your transducer and direct it in between these two so that you cut the heart in this plane and you get very pretty pictures. So you can correlate the anatomy beautifully. So this is a pathology specimen that I'm showing you, and I'm showing you the echocardiographic correlate of a AV canal. So you can see that below is the systolic frame, above is a diastolic frame with the valve open. Now I'll show you the individual leaflets. So this is the superior bridging leaflet on the right side. And that correlates very well with the pathology specimen. That is on the left side. This is the lateral leaflet. It's very important, lateral leaflet. You've got to have a decent sized lateral leaflet. Otherwise, you can't close the cleft. You will end up in mitral stenosis. So you have to demonstrate the lateral leaflet with clarity between the two papillary muscles. Okay, And then there is this inferior leaflet, which I'm showing you, which is usually attached to the crest of the ventricular septum, especially in in the Rastelli's A that we see out here. Okay, so this closed structure is the cleft. This open structure is the open cleft. This is the closed cleft. So that's something that you can recognize. Now here you have an open cleft. Now in Sisley you can close and you get a closed cleft. Again, you don't have caudal attachments at the margins of the cleft, unlike the commissures which have caudal attachments. So let's look at the checklist of the AV canal. Now, yes, sub, all these things have to be fulfilled when you report an AV canal, okay? So I've just put all these things together and I will go through them one by one. Okay, so this happened automatically through animation, but I will show you, sorry. So I'll show you one by one all the features that I have listed out. Firstly. Is it complete partial transitional? I have told you what that is. Rastelli A, B, and C, and I'll tell you about that. Mural leaflet or lateral leaflet, whether it's absent, deficient, or adequate. Papillary muscles, are they single? Are they too closely spaced? Or are they separate? Or is there a straddling of the leaflet? Left orifice, is it single or double? You can have double orifice, and you can have secondary orifices, something that I will come to a little later. Cleft, is it competent or leaking? Is it leaking from the medial aspect, lateral aspect, or both? Very important because surgeon needs to suture them. Associated lesions, of course, you don't have to go into it. PSD size, balanced versus unbalanced. So I'm going to go through these aspects. Very, very important when you report an AV canal. So here's Rastelli classification. Rastelli, you look at the leaflet from above. If it's divided and attached in the middle at the crest of the septum, it's Rastelli A. Rastelli B is when the anterior bridging or superior bridging leaflet is split towards the right ventricle and the attachments are predominantly in the right ventricle. It is rare, relatively so. 
Rastelli C is when you have a superior leaflet that is free and floating with no attachments. So that the surgeons then have to create the crux of the heart. So that's the classification that surgeons like very much because it depends on the, it, it sort of dictates the technique. Rastelli himself was a surgeon. Okay. Now Rastelli A, here's an example of Rastelli A where you can see that the superior bridging leaflet is attached at the crest of the septum. Okay. And of course, you have a decent sized lateral leaflet. Okay. Here is the same thing in Sisley, where you can see the cleft is now here and the two papillary muscles and the lateral leaflet. Now, here is Rastelli B. I couldn't get a short axis view of it, but you can see that there is an attachment predominantly on the left, right side of the. Uh, of the septum and that is relatively uncommon, but it is something that the surgeons can fix. Then finally, I'll show you Rastelli C, which you'll appreciate only in the movie. So this is again a free floating superior leaflet with no divisions, no attachments to the crest of the ventricular septum. You can see one cord going across, that doesn't count. But at the crest of the septum, nothing is attached. So that is Rastelli C. Notice again that you have a decent sized lateral leaflet or mural leaflet. Balanced versus unbalanced, extremely important. Balanced is, it's not a, it's a little bit of a gray zone, but essentially when it is one part of the valve is disproportionately positioned over one ventricle with varying degrees of hypoplasia of the opposite ventricle. So this is unbalanced favoring the left ventricle. This is unbalanced favoring the right ventricle. LV is small. Now this is the unbalanced variety that is commoner and more difficult to deal with. This is the unbalanced variety that is relatively easier to deal. So here is an example of an unbalanced canal where the right orifice is much larger than the left orifice. And remember, you can get unbalanced canal even in partial AV canal. It's not necessary that it has to be a complete AV canal. So here is an example of unequal valve orifice. You can see this valve orifice is so much bigger than this valve orifice. Okay, so you measure this and there is an index that you can derive, which I'll tell you about. So there are borderline situations with lots of room for ambiguity. It's best that you sit with the surgeons and actually show them all these aspects. Then it becomes easier for the surgeon to anticipate and plan the repair. So there are some indices. I'll tell you briefly about it. A AV valve index, LV inflow index, LV angle, and others. So here is the AV valve index where we trace the area of the left and the right orifice during diastole, and you add the two and divide by the total, and you get uh, sorry, you you take the left and divide by the total, and you get balanced as 0.5. Less than 0.4 is right dominant. Less than points great, uh, greater than 0.6 is left dominant. So essentially, you if you have 0.4 or more, then you can operate on this patient like a common AV canal. And this is a very important index. The surgeons like it, and it's a very useful way of classifying AV canal. So if AV valve index is less than 0.4 or more than 0.6, it becomes difficult to operate. Sometimes you have to put them down the single ventricle path. Okay. AV valve angle is very important because the AV valves are at a, once they're open in diastole, they're at an angle to each other and that can pose difficulties with the surgical repair as well. And that's something that you need to mention to the surgeons. And uh, again, something that the surgeons often deal with. There's something known as the LV inflow index where you sub look at the color flow width. Uh, and uh, essentially, if you have a color flow width of less than 0.55, tends to predict a high mortality in biventricular repair. And that's something that people have uh, considered using, but I won't get into the depths of it, but essentially to tell you there are various ways of classifying unbalanced skin. The most important thing is single papillary muscle. When you see a single papillary muscle, it becomes makes repair almost extremely difficult because you can't suture this cleft. There won't be any orifice left. And this is not a commission, it's a cleft. So you have to accept this result and often you have suboptimal outcomes. So again, pointing it out to the surgeon rather than having him see it and find it out on table is something which is very important because you can plan the surgery, you can prognosticate, you can anticipate. Ventricles can be measured. You have sophisticated ways of looking at them, looking at 
But you know, generally, if the AV valves are balanced, then the ventricles tend to be balanced. So I don't worry too much about trying to get some numbers from the ventricles. So now let's look at core issues. The pro sorry, uh, with the indices, there are lots of problems with standardization, agreement, etc. But remember, AV valve index is practically the most useful index. Of course, you should now classify ASD and VST. Look at the size of the ASD. You can size of the VST, and either of them could be small or large. And then you should look at. It's sometimes difficult to find a restrictive VST, but you can actually look at it carefully, measure the gradients. And in transitional AV canals, you can see them. Uh, they are in both of the subsiphoid view, where you can see that they are in the middle of the uh, of the septum, and they are very small and restrictive. And you can measure the the gradients across it. Here's an example of a large primum ASD alone. You can have some AV valve regurg that you should identify and talk about it. Again, very important to tell how much how much is the leakage, where is it, where is it going, RA or LA. And what are the surgical implications? The usual leakage is from this point where I show you the lateral edge of the cleft. And that is hard to fix for the surgeon. You can see this example where you can see the cleft at the lateral edge is leaking out here. And that makes it difficult for the surgeon to fix at times, although with some pericardial augmentation, they can fix the leakage. So once again, I just tell you, you have to classify it as transitional, partial, rastelic classification, neural leaflet, papillary muscle, left orifice versus right orifice, cleft competence, associated lesions, size of the VST, balanced versus unbalanced. So all these aspects have to be reported. And you would be able to guide the surgeon to a perfect repair. Thank you. Uh, so perfect, sir. So well done. So well done. Um, uh, could I, uh, uh, would you take the question, sir? Certainly. Uh, as long as you permit me to, in terms of time, I'll I be have, happy to. I, we, 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 we would break at around uh, 11.15. So we do have time. So I have yes. a small presentation for five minutes, nothing more than that. And that's it. So we have time uh, because uh, this is very important that we answer their questions and uh, direct. Happy, ha happy to answer questions. I try to keep it simple. And uh, I know that there are a few aspects that are sophisticated, but I think it's very important to comprehensively report AV canal so that surgical repair is well planned. I think it looks like, uh, you know, uh, it is still algebra for... Uh, uh, the adult cardiologists and uh, you know most of them has written just a very good presentation and as of now I don't think so they have any questions. So why don't you start your presentation sir uh, and, I do it the and if there are a few questions then we can answer. Yes, a few I questions. think that would be a good idea that would be a good idea after right. I start uh, I think before I start my presentation let me uh, introduce uh, Dr. S.K. Prasher sir to the the great audience. Uh, Dr. S.K. Prasher, I remember, is the person who, with the, his perseverance, uh, was able to get this Indian Academy of Echocardiography where it is today. The first meeting, uh, you know, I attended, uh, you know, was, I presume that uh, it was possibly in uh, uh, Meridian or something, and, uh, uh, and there were less than 20 uh, uh, people uh, joined uh, uh, that uh, meeting. And uh, we had a wonderful session. From there on, he started the Journal of Indian Academy of Echocardiography. And he says that he had been delivering that uh, Indian Journal of Echocardiography on uh, his bike and uh, with some assistant. And he would go kind of door to door to deliver it. Hats off to you those efforts. And we are enjoying uh, uh, the fruit of, of your, your efforts, sir, Dr. S.K. Prasher. Thank you very much. And you know, I force myself upon you. 